So, let's turn to the second general factor that affects fuel efficiency, taxes on petroleum in vehicles. So, there is a relationship between the taxes on both oil and uh, vehicles and fuel efficiency of the vehicle. So, in 2006, 10 years ago, the average cost of extracting, transporting, and refining a gallon of gasoline was $2.01, so just over $2 a gallon um, globally to, re to get the oil from underground, transport it to where it's refined, and then refine it into gasoline. It cost just over $2 a gallon. But in 2006, the average price of gasoline at the pump was highly variable. Anywhere from eight cents a gallon to seven dollars and nineteen cents per gallon, depending on country or varying by country, and it depends. The price you pay at the pump depends on subsidies and uh, taxes. The major oil exporting countries, including some in the Middle East, some in South America, tend to subsidize fuel, whereas most other countries tax fuel, and the countries that subsidize fuel have lower uh, prices at the pump. Whereas the t countries that tax it more ha have higher tax rates, um, generally that is associated with higher costs at the pump. Now, as of August 7th, 2016, the average gas price in the U.S. was $2.14 per gallon. This is courtesy of the website GasBuddy.com. You might have heard of it. Um, there. It's, there's not only the website, but there's an app for it, and it's very useful. It allows you to use a Google Map interface to find the prices of gasoline in your area, and so you can find the cheapest gas. Um, the prices are frequently updated by uh, drivers. In California, the average price of gasoline was $2.67 per gallon, and this is about 25% more than the nationwide price. Um, and... When we talk about taxes on fuel, we need to understand they are an attractive source of revenue. They, amount, they amass vast sums, um, amounting to over a trillion dollars, $1.2 trillion in 2004, 10.8% of all revenues collected by governments. They tend to be easier to collect than other taxes because they are assessed at refineries or large wholesales, sailors, which are few in number. And people are somewhat less adverse to fuel taxes than other taxes because a major portion of these revenues is spent on visible infrastructure projects. Okay, you've, you've, you've probably seen these road signs and construction zones along U.S. highways saying your tax dollars at work. And the public generally recognizes that in addition to high fuel prices, high fuel taxes discourage um, uh, crazy driving or really fast driving, okay? as well as encourage the purchase of more fuel efficient and less polluting vehicles. Now the taxes on fuel are only part of the story when we talk about taxes. Um, there are supplemental taxes on vehicles. Um, most governments assess a value added tax or sales tax at the time of purchase. That's based on the percentage of the purchase price. Most also assess a license or registration fee at the time of purchase of a vehicle. And this tax often varies with the value of the vehicle and some measure of, of its fuel consumption. And also, um, most governments assess an annual, yearly circulation or road use fee. And this tax is often keyed to some measure of its fuel efficiency. So you're starting to see the relationship between taxes on um, petroleum vehicles and elements of a driving vehicle and the uh, connection to fuel efficiency. Okay, Here's a Shell service station and we have a uh, gentleman with a motorcycle and a gentleman here on his cell phone. Okay, He used to call me on the cell phone. So we can look at average gasoline prices um, in 2006, yes 10 years old by country and also diesel prices by country and you'll see a wide range in Turkmenistan the average gasoline price in 2006 was 
about eight cents a gallon. Okay, yes, crazy, right? Just unbelievable. Diesel is even cheaper, a few pennies per gallon. Prices have increased um, a little since then, but they're still extremely low. You all, you see, and you see the uh, next low lowest. The next the countries are the lowest gas prices. Venezuela, okay, Iran, not Iran, okay, but Iran. Um, R- Rwanda, which actually has very inexpensive gas prices, but ha- much higher diesel prices, which is interesting. Libya, Saudi Arabia, okay, uh, Kuwait, Egypt, Yemen. So you see some of the Middle Eastern countries that export oil. Um, and also you'll see on this list some South American countries that export a lot of oil. Okay. And here's the United States. Okay. Um, just uh, around, just over two dollars a gallon. Okay. And so you can continue through and and look at this list if you have countries that you're interested in looking at uh, for their gas prices. But let's just go toward the end of the list for now. See some of the the countries that have the highest gas prices. Eritrea, gasoline is nearly $8 a gallon. Okay, Iceland, gasoline is extremely expensive. Um, could have to do with the fact that Iceland is a small island and um, in uh, the middle of the Atlantic, northern Atlantic, and the gasoline has to be shipped there by plane, and so there's high fuel costs to ship the gasoline. Turkey has high gas prices. Um... You'll see some of these European countries, the Norway, the Netherlands, the UK, very high gas prices. Um, gasoline prices were over $6 a gallon in the United Kingdom in uh, 2006. And they're about 6 to $7 a gallon um, equivalent today. Now, if you go to the United Kingdom or you go to the European countries, um, it, at first glance, it might look like the gasoline price is cheaper because... They'll show the gasoline prices in price uh, g- price per liter, and there's about three and a half liters in a gallon. So it might look, oh, it's only like a dollar fifty a gallon, then you or so two dollars a gallon. Then you realize you have to multiply that by about three and a half. Okay. So. Again, in many countries, taxes on fuel represents a major source of government revenue. Here's a figure showing percentage of revenues collected by governments, national governments, that derive from taxes on fuel. The green um, bars show the percentage of government revenue in a country that's from taxes on fuels. The red shows um, countries that subsidize fuels, okay? And the way to read that is basically you'd you'd say um, certain percentage, say take Egypt, minus 14, 14% of Egypt's total government revenue actually goes to subsidizing fuel, okay? It's not used to... um, uh, it's not used to add to the government revenue, but instead it's basically you could think of it as taken out of the government revenue to subsidize fuel and decrease the price. Okay, In the United States, about 12% of the government revenue derives from taxes on fuel. Um, South Korea, about a third of their government revenue derives from taxes on fuel. Okay, Whereas for some of these oil exporting countries, Venezuela, Yemen... Uh, these two, nearly a fifth of all government revenue is actually used to subsidize the fuel. And again, you see some of these oil exporting countries here are as the ones that subsidize fuel the most. Saudi Arabia, we mentioned um, Egypt, Venezuela. Um, yes. Hey, by the way, here's Syria, right? A lot of talk in politics about um, Syrian refugees. So... In the U.S., gasoline prices vary greatly by state due to tax differences. And here we're going to look at a figure showing gas prices not only by state but by individual um, counties and states 
using the uh, data from gasbuddy.com. So we'll be able to see which states have the uh, least expensive gas prices, which ones have the most expensive gas prices. Okay, so here you go. Um, and we have the scale here, dollars per gallon. The As you can see, the red colors represent the highest or higher gas prices, whereas you start then going into orange, yellow, and green, you're looking at lower and lower gas prices. The darkest shading of green has the cheapest gas prices that just is less than 166 a gallon, okay? So where do you see the most expensive gas prices? The West Coast states, especially California, um, where you see much of the state has gas prices over 262 a gallon. Okay, the Bay Area, um, extreme Northern California, uh, the Southern California coast, Sierra Nevada region, right? There are some pockets of California where you can pay close to two dollars a gallon, but they're scattered and few in between. Oregon has gas prices generally from about two twenty six to um, ooh two sixty two a gallon. Okay, Washington slightly higher gas prices than Oregon, and it's also interesting that you see high. Relatively higher gas prices in uh, Montana, Idaho, Nevada, Utah. Um, earlier this year, gas prices were much closer to $2 a gallon in some of these um, f further east states, um, but still wet, west, of the, or west of the Rockies or in the Rocky Mountains. Um, but the uh, high gas prices from the west coast have kind of moved eastward over this past e uh, year. And then once you get to the east of the Rocky Mountains, you see the change, especially um, further south, right? So you see the, mo ch the uh, cheapest gas prices are generally in the southern states. Um, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, okay, parts of Oklahoma, there's pockets of Texas where gas prices are under $1.66 a gallon. But even so, in you know Texas, everything's bigger in Texas, right? Texas is the largest state by area in the continental U.S. It's it looks from here where if you're driving across Texas, it's very like unlikely that gas will be more than um, two dollars a gallon. Except there's a few pockets here, and even so, it's it's almost it's almost it's generally very rare that gas will be more than what two fourteen a gallon. Okay. Um, Florida actually has higher gas prices um, in the uh, southern part of the state, including uh, some of the populated areas, and then the panhandle. And you see relatively low gas prices in the southern plain states, but higher gas prices in the northern plain states, which is interesting. Also, high gas prices have increased this year over Michigan. Um, and you'll see high gas prices in New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Connecticut, um, from parts of Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, but what's very interesting is that while most of the Northeast states has, basically, if you're in the Northeast states here, you're going to be looking at anywhere from average to high gas prices, okay? Except for New Jersey or New Jersey, which is very interesting because unlike these other Northeastern states, generally, um, the state of New Jersey has very low gas prices, under $2 a gallon. Um, generally from about $1.66 to at most two, $2.02 a gallon, okay? And I was in New Jersey earlier this summer, and yes, it's true. You had a lot of gas price signs there under $2 a gallon. You might be wondering why that is, why it's different from the other Northeast states. Again, we talk about taxes on fuel. Um, Chris Christie has been governor of New Jersey for several years, um, a Republican, and um, that could have some influence because, you know, Republicans uh, generally want lower taxes, and the, and the sales tax, for example, is lower in New Jersey, and so the taxes on fuel could be lower, which is why the gas prices are lower. Um, would be interesting to see if, uh, how if there's any connection between who gets elected this fall, whether it be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, and the gas prices 
in general, from what I've read, there's not a whole lot of effect of the president, his or her self, on the gas prices. Um, because the gas prices are more affected by individual state governments, state taxes, revenues, okay? Um, so, as you can see by this figure, okay? But we'll see what happens. So, let's talk about the next factor that affects fuel efficiency, transportation efficiency, consumer preferences. So, without considering economics or regulations, Consumers may prefer larger vehicles with faster accelerations. I say may here. In the book, it says uh, consumers tend to prefer larger vehicles with faster acceleration. But that really depends on where you go. Like in California, that might not necessarily be the case. Yes, not to say that some people don't want a large truck, right, or a, you know, a big SUV, but in, in in some states like California, more environmental states, people actually want smaller cars that are more fuel efficient um, and less polluting, right? So, so, but definitely for sure what, um, what you prefer to affects the type of car you buy, which affects the fuel efficiency of your vehicle. Now, through technological innovation, efficiency has still increased slightly, despite the fact that in the U.S., vehicles now weigh more and are more powerful and have quicker accelerations than they used to. Um, so here's what happened going from the mid-70s to the late 2000s. Um, in the U.S., first of all, for, shown in the red and uh, blue for weight and power, you see what happened... As we went into the, from the mid-70s into the late-70s, there was a sharp decline in both weight and power. Okay, the vehicles became smaller, less powerful. Um, and this was an effect of the oil embargo. Uh, and oil, there were oil crises in the 70s, okay? So the, the vehicles became smaller, less powerful, because that helped improve fuel efficiency, which you can see down here, fuel efficiency improved. Of vehicles in the US and then starting in the early 80s for um, a few years there wasn't much change in how large the vehicles were how powerful they were their uh, efficiency um, but then over time the vehicles became heavier they became more powerful okay so as of the late 2000s the vehicles on average were as heavy as the vehicles manufactured in the mid-70s, but they are much more powerful now than the vehicles manufactured in the mid-70s. And also what you see is accelerations decreased. Vehicles made in the 70s had an average 0 to 60 mile per hour, um, or you know, 0 to 60 acceleration of about, what, 14 seconds. Now it's down to 10 seconds. And there's some vehicles that can get from 0 to 60 in a matter of 4 seconds or less, right? Um, some of those really uh, powerful sports cars. Even so, fuel efficiency remained fairly constant in the U.S. from the early 80s to the mid-2000s, and within the last uh, several years, it's actually been increasing slightly. So this is because technology has helped us. We've been able to have um, bigger, uh, more powerful, quicker accelerating vehicles and not this experience a decrease in fuel efficiency, in fact, a slight increase. Then you can talk, talk about the European Union, which includes uh, a lot of the Western European countries, such as Bra uh, Great Britain, just kidding, Brexit, okay, earlier this year. Um, and what you see is there's a difference, okay? So first of all, in the European Union, the... Uh, Vehicles, you see orange here, weigh, they, they weigh less. They're smaller. They also are significantly less powerful, okay, than the U.S. vehicles. Now, there's not as much data here. The data for the uh, European Union vehicles goes from about the early 90s into the early 2000s, but you still see, over that time period, significantly smaller and less powerful vehicles. You also see 
um, slower efficiencies, okay, and this could, or sorry, slower accelerations, and this could be because they're less powerful, so it takes longer to get from 0 to 60 miles per hour, and also much higher fuel efficiencies, as we've seen earlier, um, when we're talking about, say, those countries of uh, Germany, um, France, and Great Britain, which until recently, well, as of this data was part of the European Union, higher fuel efficiencies than the vehicles made in the U.S. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship between diesel and transportation efficiency. Diesel is denser than gasoline. Okay, it has a higher mass per volume. And therefore, it contains more energy per volume. Okay, the, um, the mass, the material in the fuel is converted into energy. And so there's more mass per volume. And in fact, due to this, diesel has, due to the specific higher density, it has about 11% more energy per volume. So if you have a gallon of gasoline and a gallon of diesel, the gallon of uh, diesel will have about 11, provide 11% 11 more energy for transportation than gasoline. And diesel engines are more efficient than gasoline engines in converting fuel efficiency into mechanical work. Okay, So they're more efficient at converting fuel efficiency into work to help the vehicle uh, go. And diesel engines obtain about 40% higher fuel efficiency per volume of than gasoline engines of the same power. Okay. Large trucks and agricultural vehicles have diesel engines to take advantage of this higher fuel efficiency. And many countries, in consideration of the role of such vehicles in their economy, do not tax diesel fuel as heavily as gasoline. Um, right now in the U.S., average diesel price at the pump is about 229 to 30 a gallon so it's just slightly higher than um, regular unleaded gasoline we were talking about those gasoline prices earlier that's generally um, regular okay and you'll you I'm sure you've noticed the the, the medium or uh, plus depending on what gas station it is the second grade tends to be about 10 cents more per gallon the second grade of gasoline the premium highest grade gasoline at a station generally is around 20 25 cents more than the per gallon in the regular price um, st still so so uh, again talk about some of the Western European countries perhaps half of all new car sales are of uh, diesel powered vehicles because of this higher fuel efficiency okay still small diesel engines have been plagued with performance issues in the past and not as much now such as being noisier, um, generating more vibrations, being more difficult to start, emitting thick black smoke in their exhaust, and exhibiting slower acceleration than their gasoline counterparts. But technical advances in the past few decades have helped overcome these performance issues. Um, so in the, the, the diesel engines are getting less noisy, they are more, they're start easier, um, they're less polluting, okay? They're really actually becoming uh, very competitive with gasoline um, engines, for even for, in some countries, for the new small cars. Now, comparing the greenhouse gas emissions of diesel-powered and gasoline-powered vehicles can be tricky. We talk about diesel fuel is, contains more energy per volume. Um, it also, though, releases about 15% more carbon dioxide per volume of fuel combusted. Diesel engines weigh more than gasoline engines of the same power because diesels require a larger displacement for complete combustion and heavier components to withstand higher pressures and temperatures. In small vehicles, a diesel engine contributes a greater percentage of the total vehicle weight than a gasoline engine, and this weight penalty diminishes the diesel engine's advantage in fuel efficiency from 40 to 20 percent. Um, People tend to purchase diesel-powered vehicles with a larger engine also because of diesel's higher fuel efficiency. 
And the net result is that the higher fuel efficiency of diesel engines in light duty vehicles sometimes barely compensates for higher CO2 emissions, heavier weights. Um, in total, therefore, diesel powered vehicles emit around 5 to 30 percent less greenhouse gases per distance traveled than their gasoline equivalents. Okay. So recognize that we talk about diesel powered vehicles. Um, we talk about diesel fuel compared to gasoline fuel. It is complicated, okay, but there's definitely some benefits for in terms of fuel efficiency. Okay, let's talk about regulating automobile manufacturers. So, you see here, here's Congress, right? Here's where uh, uh, stuff gets done. In 1975, U.S. enacted the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Regulations, or CAFE Regulations. And these regulations establish that fuel efficiency of cars, you know, manufacturers, could be a Toyota, could be Ford, Honda. U.S. fleet has to meet a minimum average value. Okay. In 1978, that minimum average value was 18 miles per gallon for passenger cars, and 17.2 miles per gallon for small trucks. By 1985, the minimum threshold had increased to 27.5 miles per gallon for passenger cars, 21.6 miles per gallon for small trucks. Okay. Um, there has been controversy concerning the CAFE regulations. It's generated disagreements about the effects on um, different factors or different, um, uh, yeah, factors. One, the mix of vehicles in the U.S., okay, such as a mixture of larger and smaller vehicles. Two, overall efficiency of this mix. Um, three, the safety of vehicles, okay. Um, talk about if improving fuel efficiency could have an uh, effect on the safety of vehicles. For the cost to consumers, the higher fuel efficient vehicles might have um, higher costs, right? And five, health of the domestic automobile industry. Now, um, there's um, there are pending standards for fuel efficiency going forward for different countries. Let's take a look at some of these current, being current a few years old from the book and pending um, governmental regulations on fuel efficiency standards of passenger vehicles. So, here are the regulations on fuel efficiency from the early 2000s um, to around 2010 using observational data and then pending uh, standards going forward a few years. You see that for Japan and the European Union, as of the early to mid-2000s, fuel efficiency standards were um, about f close to 40 to 50 miles per gallon in those countries. Okay. And we talked about, you might be wondering, when we talked about the early 2000s, Japan's average fuel efficiency of the new vehicles was close to the U.S., lower 20 range in miles per gallon. Well, there's been um, new regulations that have really tried to increase the fuel efficiency, and in recent years, the fuel efficiency in Japan has greatly increased, okay? In the U.S., the fuel efficiency standards was still in the low 20 uh, mile per gallon range. Um, same with California, but then you see California's fuel efficiency take a spike upward in the early 2000s and continue increasing into the uh, current time. And so now, um, fuel efficiency standards for new vehicles um, sold in California are closer to 35 plus miles per gallon. In 2006, the state of California passed legislation that required higher vehicle fuel efficiencies. California became the first state to have a, its own minimum um, fuel efficiency of new vehicles sold. Okay, even in China, um, 
you see fuel efficiencies of new vehicles, the governmental regulations having fuel efficiencies of already um, above 30 miles per gallon in the early 2000s, increasing to 35 miles per gallon by the mid to late 2000s, okay? Now, when we talk about ways to uh, mitigate a, um, against global warming from the transportation sector, we can talk about improving fuel efficiency for a personal vehicle. We can also talk about other ways to improve, um, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. We can talk about alternative methods of transportation, okay? We can talk about public transportation and efficiency. You might be wondering what modes of transportation have the lowest carbon footprints. The lowest carbon emissions per person per distance traveled tends to be bicycling, walking, and running. And in general, public transportation has a lower carbon emission intensity, carbon emission intensity being um, uh, carbon emitted per person per distance traveled than private. Okay. A central factor in carbon emission intensity is the occupancy of the vehicle. Okay. If you have two people in the same vehicle, um, traveling the same distance versus one person in that that certain vehicle traveling the same distance. The the, the via, when you have two people in the vehicle, you'll basically cut the carbon emission intensity in half. Okay. Um, let's take a look at v various modes of transportation and the carbon emission intensities for them. For the world, or for United Kingdom, um, United States, or either. So here are greenhouse gas emissions for various modes of transportation in grams of carbon per person per kilometer. Blue uh, represents United Kingdom, red represents United States, and purple represents either of those two countries. So we see out of all these modes of transportation, bicycling has the lowest um, carbon emission intensity, just a few grams of carbon per person per kilometer. You might be thinking, well, how is that? You know, there, unless you're talking about one of those electric bikes, right? There's, there's not an engine on a bicycle. There's no emi um, pollution emitted from a bicycle. Well, you do have to remember that there's carbon inside of us humans, right? And so when you breathe out, you breathe carbon out. And so that's um, part of the reason um, for that, the main reason, actually. Same with walking and running. Um, when you breathe out, you breathe out carbon. We have city transit trains for United Kingdom and United States. Now, in the United Kingdom, they're at... Um, the carbon emission intensity of city trains is around 15 grams of carbon per person per kilometer, whereas it's uh, slightly more than double that in the U.S. And it could be that basically the United Kingdom trains are um, more crowded on average. The city United city trains in the U.K. are more crowded, more people take them than in the U.S., okay? Um... So city transit, this could be the VTA light rail, this could be Muni Metro, okay? Here's Vanpool for either country. Actually, the same carbon emission intensity for the U.S. as city trains. And inner city trains, like BART, um, could also be VTA light rail, which does go to the suburbs around San Jose. It's similar as for city transit. Uh, commuter trains, such as Caltrain, um, are similar, have similar carbon emission intensities for two, these two countries as well. A little lower in the U.S. than for inner city or city trains. Here are buses, and this is really interesting to look at. The average 
the carbon emission intensity for buses in the United Kingdom is about, um, well, a little more than 20 uh, grams of carbon per person per kilometer. But in the U.S., it's much higher. It's um, above 50, perhaps 55 grams of carbon per person per kilometer. And to keep that in mind, because if you go down the list, look at car, in the U.S., it's about 40 grams of carbon per person per kilometer. So in the U.S., the carbon emission intensity for buses is higher than for cars, okay? And that that doesn't sound that good, right? That sounds like it's defeating the purpose. So wait, isn't, you know, part of the reason we ride the bus is um, to help the environment, right? Reduce emissions. Well, it, part of the, the, it has, the reason for this has to do with the fact that the buses are not necessarily at capa full capacity. Um, so, if more people would ride the buses on average in the U.S., if more people would rely on them, then the carbon emission intensity would go down, okay? You see, in the United Kingdom, on the other hand, it's different. In the United Kingdom, the carbon emission intensity for buses is about half or less than for cars. And that has to do with the fact that in the United Kingdom, more people rely on buses than in the United States, okay? So in San Jose, the buses are um, often at um, full seating capacity or, or uh, there will be standing room only on them, regardless of the time of day, um, regardless of the day of the week. San Jose, the buses can be fairly crowded, especially in commute hours, but this isn't the case everywhere. Um, I lived in Walnut Creek for several years, and the buses out there, the County Connection buses, often have just a few people on them, okay? So, we have other modes of transportation. We have motorcycles, which um, in the U.S. have lower carbon emission intensities than buses and cars. Um, also, you'll notice personal trucks have slightly higher carbon emission intensities for both the United Kingdom and the United States than cars, okay? Um, less fuel efficient, makes sense. On average... Airplane, the, the airplane mode of transportation has slightly lower carbon emission intensities than cars in the United Kingdom, but slightly higher carbon emission intensities than cars in the U.S., which is interesting. Um, some of the differences between the United States and the United Kingdom in carbon emission intensity of uh, when you're looking at personal vehicles can hinge on the estimated passenger occupancy rate. Um, the U.S. Uh, estimate for personal trucks, by the way, which includes SUVs and king cabs, assumes about 1.72 occupants, whereas the U.K. estimate assumes 1.25 occupants. Cruise ships have carbon emission intensities of around 90 grams of carbon per cap a person per kilometer, okay? Um, and you might be wondering why. Well, it turns out, only 40 to 85 percent of the fuel consumption on a cruise ship serves for propulsion. The rest serves for passenger uh, amenities like electricity, hot water, okay? Um, things that allow you to turn up on the cruise ship. Taxis and limos have very high carbon emission intensities. Um, of course, a lot there's a lot of, for a limo, a lot of energy that goes a lot of the energy is used for the TVs, for the games. Um, the limos are very long, okay, which uh, requires more energy and they're more polluting. And helicopters have very high carbon emission intensities. Um, you know, in a helicopter, you can't fit more than a few people. It takes a lot of energy to get the propellers moving and um, to have a helicopter fly, whereas airplanes can fit a uh, hundred or hundreds of people. Now, despite incentives for carpool lanes and toll breaks over recent years, single occupancy vehicles remain the most popular mode of transportation in the U.S. 
this figure shows the number of people in millions in in the uh, number of Americans in millions who travel to work each day via different modes of transportation. Okay, by the way, other means but those who bicycle or walk or perhaps run if they're in a hurry or um they have the uh, luxury of say a shower at work or they don't have to worry about sweat coming into work sweaty sweaty. So what happened is, we, and we went forward from the we went from the late eighties to the late two thousands. The number of people in the U.S. who commute to work each day via single occupancy vehicle, okay, just that their cell, the one person in a car, a small a car or small truck, increased from eighty million to about a um, hundred and five million. Okay, today it's higher. Um. Whereas the number of Americans who carpool each day to work in really didn't change much, okay, over this time period. While there was a um, close to a thirty one third increase, a thirty two percent, thirty one percent increase in the number of Americans who commute via, to work each day via single occupancy vehicle, there's almost no change in the number of Americans who uh, commute to work via carpool, okay? Despite, again, you know, the, the, the incentive, the lanes, if, you have, if you're carpooling, you can get in the carpool lane and get to work much faster. Um, and you can save money at the toll booth if you carpool. There was a, a, there was a somewhat of an increase from perhaps five of uh, uh, somewhat of an increase in the number of people who get to work each day via public transit in America from perhaps five million to oh nine million okay nice percentage increase but but what you see is that compared to the number of people who get to work each day um, via their own car with nobody else in their car people who actually carpool and use public transportation is an extremely small fraction of that, okay? The overwhelming majority of Americans get to work each day via single occupancy vehicle, okay? And only a few a million people, Americans get to work each day walking or um, bicycling. Now, you do have to remember that this is for the U.S. as a whole. It's, all, it's different depending on where you go. Like in San Francisco, San Jose, a lot of people get to work each day or to school each day, bicycling, uh, walking, okay? Um, and there, there tends to be higher percentage of people carpooling in, uh, in, say, more environmentally conscious areas like the Bay Area, uh, Portland, Oregon, okay, Seattle, Washington. Um... By the way, recently Uber Pool has been expanding, and now in in uh, more cities you're able to use Uber Pool, that which basically you can save money by be willing to sh be willing uh, to share your ride, Uber ride with another passenger, um, and this has uh, greatly reduced emissions. It turns out. Um, there was a Facebook post by Uber from April of 2016 that said, quote, by choosing to use Uber Pool, riders like you have eliminated over 90 million miles, reduced gas consumption by 1.8 million gallons, and cut carbon dioxide emissions by 16,000 metric tons. And that's only in 2016. Thanks for helping make a difference on Earth Day and every day. Speaking of Uber, you'll notice a lot of the drivers use uh, energy-efficient gasoline cars like Honda Civics and Toyota Camrys, but a lot of the drivers use uh, hybrids like the Prius. We'll be talking more about hybrids later. Now, there's a clear relationship between the price of oil and uh, price of gasoline, and this makes sense since ga uh, gasoline is made from oil. Okay. Here are average 
U.S. gas prices, okay, per gallon, and and uh, oil prices per barrel from 1990 to 2010, okay. And uh, these are yearly average gas and oil prices, okay. So what you see is that during the 90s, average average regular unleaded gas prices in the U.S. were between one dollar and uh, about a dollar thirty-five or so. Okay, remember these are yearly prices. So some there are some times where the gas prices might be higher than what sh are shown on average. And of course, in some states, the gasoline prices were higher. Nonetheless, they were very low in the '90s compared to today, at least. And oil prices during the '90s ranged from about ten dollars a barrel to. 25 maybe close to $30 a barrel okay and then as you went through the first part of the 2000s the early to mid 2000s you saw a slow increase um, in gas prices by 2004 the average gas price in the US was up to $1.50 a gallon by 2005 it was $1.75 a gallon by 2006 it was over $2 a gallon and by uh, 2008, it was over $3 a gallon, okay? So it basically doubled, actually, in a matter of five years. Um, and this was unprecedented territory for the gas prices in the U.S. And you notice as gas prices increased, you see the oil prices increased. And, and that's basically the oil price increasing caused the gas prices to go up, okay? Um, because the price of oil is what drives the price of gasoline at the pump. So you you might you know you might have been young, but I'm sure you were younger, but I'm sure you remember how the gas prices really started uh, um, increasing as we went into the mid 2000s until um, yeah. Now then, what you see is a dramatic drop off in gas price from 2008 to 2009. By 2009, average U.S. gas price was down under two dollars a gallon again. And then it increased the following year. And again, it's over $2 a gallon today. Why the dramatic drop-off in gas price as well oil, as oil price? You know, in 2008, the average price of oil was closing in on $100 a barrel. Okay? Remember, it was never above um, $30 a barrel in the 90s. And then by 2009, the price of oil was under $40 a barrel. Why? I've asked this question. Some people say, well, Obama, right? It's when Obama took office, right? Um, it, it was, this has to do with the recession, right? Remember when the recession, the Great Recession started, 2008, okay? Um, and so what happened was the price of oil went down uh, due to the recession, okay? The economy collapsing. And so while... Um, Floor closures were happening. People were losing their jobs. Okay, people were losing their homes. Um, the economic mood of the country was turning really, really sour. You were saving some money at the gas pump. Okay, 